Kei ngā kai whakaero i te kupu, te nā koutou katoa, nau mai haramai ki tapatahi, e whakapāhoti ana e whakata Māori. Ko tā mātou mahi, he whāngai atu i te tika me te pono o te kōrero kia koutou. Kā tira, welcome to Tapatahi, our new online program that puts your questions to officials and decision makers, shares Māori stories and perspectives, and keeps you informed about COVID-19. Tapatahi literally means to unite and is taken from the well-known Māori song Tu Tira Mai Ngā Iwi. And it's all about doing this together. So if you have a question or comment, please let us know. So as we do every day, here's what you need to know in 30 seconds. The latest figures show that 589 people have tested positive with the virus. That's 76 new cases in the last 24 hours. 27 of the 589 identify as Māori and 14 as Pacifica. The other big news is that some New Zealanders living in Australia will be able to access up to 1500 bucks per fortnight in COVID-19 job support. But is it too little, too late? And does it go far enough? New Zealanders on the 444 Special Class Working Visa will be eligible. Businesses will receive a fortnightly wage subsidy up to 1500 per employee as part of a government bid to prevent millions of people from losing their jobs. It's expected that 6 million people will access the JobKeeper payment over the next six months. The wage subsidy will include not-for-profit employees and New Zealanders who work in Australia but are typically unable to access welfare programmes. To discuss this further, we're now joined by Clifford and Maria Salmon, who have lived in Perth for more than five years. Tēnā kōrua and thank you for joining us. Good morning. morning. How are you? Good, thank you. We're also joined by Levi Hodges, who is currently in self-isolation at an Auckland hotel. After being told that there was no support for him and other Kiwis in Australia, he decided to return home. Levi, tēnā koe. Kia if I could start off, uh, Maria and Clifford, with you uh, in Perth joining us now, how are you? How are you coping? Yeah, we're doing good. So we're actually in day 11 or 12 of full isolation after returning from New Zealand when we went home for a holiday. Um, so it's been interesting. We're in a house. We actually can't go out the front yard, so only the backyard is what we're confined to at the moment. And we have deli groceries delivered as well. So, of course, you had planned a month, uh, a month long holiday here back at home, but you had to cut that short because of COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. So we came home for um, a beautiful holiday down in the Bay of Plenty um, and we actually had to cut it short. The minute we noticed that there were defect warnings to come back to Australia um, by the Australian government, we sort of were in the position where we go, do we come home or do we stay in New Zealand? Um, and for us, it was really a matter of if those borders do close and we are locked out of Perth or we can't get a direct flight and we have to quarantine another stage, we needed to make sure that we got back here fast enough for that we were safe. So you're in self-isolation now. Does that mean that either of you are working? No, no so no, neither no. of us are working. So, Maria, talk to us about your situation. So you were in full-time employment in retail, but now that's been reduced, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. So I work in a large retail company and I oversee WA, South Australia and Malaysia operations. Um, and for me, we have been now put in the position where we've had to stand team down, um, but also for us based at support office, we're now without roles potentially. Um, obviously, the new announcement has just been released about the job keeper package, which is available to um, Australian workers. Um, however, I think it's also really important to understand that if we are eligible and that if your employer decides to register, um, and they have obviously the cash flow to be able to pay out the next month's worth of salaries before seeing that back in um, their bank accounts from the ATO, is that you may be without money and you will find it hard in Australia to ensure that you can pay your rent and put food on the table. Well, talk to us about your eligibility. Based on the criteria and understanding that it's only just been announced in the last uh, 24 hours, do you mm -hmm. both qualify for the support that's now on offer? So at this stage, um, we're fairly certain that I qualify. We're just waiting for a business update on that. Again, it's really uncertain. There's a lot of grey areas around some of these legislations that they, the Australian market do put out. Um, and then as for Clifford, it's really, I guess, uncertain as well in the mining industry and whether or not his employers 
choose to register as well. So Clifford, you're currently uh, not working at the moment um, and you have been working in the mines? Yeah, I have been working in the mines the last five years and I suppose it's all contract work, so we sort of prep for this sort of stuff. So we always have a safety net for at least about three to six months because of the, um, the mining industry, how up and down it sort of is. So there'll be a lot of people affected um, flying interstate at the moment because WA has closed off its borders. So, well, if it does go to full lockdown, then yeah, I think they're gonna have to find guys local or just go right down to skeleton crews to run the, run the plants. Mm. Okay, let's bring Levi in now. Thank you, Levi, um, for waiting patiently there. Of course, you are in self-isolation at an Auckland hotel. How are you coping? Um, so far, so good. The facilities are very good. But, um, yeah, we're just left up in the air with what's going on in Australia, so it's not a very good situation for all of us in the world at the moment. So tell us about your story. You were based in Australia, of course, and then you made the, made the decision to come home. Tell us why. Uh, so um, as soon as there was uh, the possibility of being laid off work and um, potentially losing money, um, I went and tried to sort out different avenues as to where I could receive any kind of help um, from the Australian government. And we were rebuffed at every single place that we went to. Um, we were told that basically, or essentially, Kiwi, if they want the best part of best treatment, that they should go home because there's no real, um, there's no, uh, nothing on offer for us over there. So, of course, you took that advice and you came home. And now, in the last 24 hours, of course, we've heard that a support package is being made available to some Kiwis living in Australia. How do you feel about that? Uh, not happy, <laughs> but um, they, they could have released this a lot earlier and it would have prevented a lot of Kiwis being put out. Um, yeah, it's not, not, it's not nice. We've, we've been told that we can um, withdraw $10,000 from our superannuation, but penalties apply to that as well in the long run, so um, a lot of us weren't willing to do that. So how long have you got left in self-isolation before you can, uh, before you move on from the hotel? Uh, 12 days, 14 days isolation. Um, when you first arrive in the country, uh, you were self-isolated for 24 hours. And then after that, the rules become a little bit more lenient. I'm interested to know what the experience was like on the, on the flight home, right? And what happened at the airport and then you being transferred to a hotel. Talk to us about that. Okay, um, so on the plane, it's, it, there was one row per person. Um, they, they separated us quite quite well. Um, very accommodating as well. Once we got arrived to the airport, we um, had temperature tests done by our ears, and they gave us a temperature reading. Um, so that was the first level of that we went through there, and we got asked if we were symptomatic in any kind of way. Answers were provided, and then we were shuttled in a bus probably about 30 metres from the um, airport to the hotel. And it's been like that since. So it sounds like it was a pretty safe process. Yes, very, very safe. And now, of course, you find yourself in self-isolation in a hotel and under normal circumstances, anybody would love to be staying at a hotel, but I suspect it's not as great living in self-isolation. Uh, it's, it's not ideal. I'd rather be at home with my family from 100% uh, about that. Mm. So what happens, what, what, what happens after self-isolation for you? Because, of course, uh, we're all living in our own bubbles at the moment. Are you able to travel? Um, have you been told what the next steps look like or shown what the next, next steps may look like for you? Yes, so... Um it could be sooner. So the people that are here at the moment at the hotel that need to move on to Christchurch and Wellington, flights are being arranged for them um, as soon as possible. Um, anyone else that is... Um, so lay away. There's a few people here um, from international countries as well. We've got one from Ireland, one from Mexico. Flights are being arranged specifically for them as well, I believe. And um, 
Uh, so after that, if you don't have transport to your designated address, they will provide transport to the designated address. So it's all very, very good. Does that have to be a local address or can you, for example, travel to another region? So for me, I'm going to Whakatane. And um, so that, that's a four hour drive away. So I'm going to need someone to come and pick me up. And it'll probably be my, my father. So he'll, he'll come and pick me up. But it has to be one person in the car. You're not allowed more than one person coming to pick you up. So that, that's good as well. What does the average day look like for you in the hotel? Are you allowed outside your hotel room? Can you have contact with anybody else as long as you're respecting social distancing? What happens when, it, when, when you're hungry? Is, is it room service? Um, talk to us a, a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, so, yes, you have room service provided. You have three square meals a day. Very nutritious, very filling. Um, you're not allowed to go more than 50 metres away from the hotel, which everyone in the hotel and in self-isolation is in agreement with. It's for the benefit of everyone. Um, hotel staff and the security and the police that are here as well are very, very friendly. So everything that, um, everything that can be done to make us feel welcome and accommodated is being done, and it's, it's very good. Clifford and Maria, if I can bring you uh, back into the conversation now, what are your friends and family uh, coping with or dealing with at the moment? What are other Māori living around you and, and, and Māori that you know, living in Perth, living in Australia, how are they fearing, do you think? Look, it's such an unknown um, period of time at the moment. You know, with us being on these special class visas, you know, like... Liam said before that we are in a position where we actually get no financial support whatsoever. So this does bring a little bit of reprieve that potentially we'll, we'll get some comp, you know, allowance or wage subsidy provided. But we have friends and family here, well, friends, um, who really are wondering where they're going to get their next dollar from. Mm. You know, they have to think about being able to put food on the table for their family. They've got to be able to figure out, can they pay rent? Can they pay... Um, their mortgages, can they pay, you know, to fill the car up with petrol to go to the supermarket? It's a very real situation here, you know, that your whānau could potentially be homeless. And, you know, I think it's really important that as Kiwis, we make sure that we reach out to those that we have here in Australia and we make sure that they are okay. You know, and I think for us, you know, we've got to be very conscious as well that mental health is going to be a very real issue. For a lot of Kiwis that are here, you know, they're proud to be in Australia and they're proud to be working away from home. And for some of them, you know, they are actually providing food on the table for their whanos back in New Zealand. And are they going to be able to do that now? Very unlikely. And, and you know, are they going to be able to ask for help or is this the time that, you know, we have to reach out and say, look, are you OK? And what can we do to help you? Some people will be making the decision to pack up and, and go back to New Zealand. But again, they're going to be faced with so many difficulties and obstacles trying to get back. You know, if you sell everything that you own here in Australia and then you potentially put your house on the market, nobody's going to buy it. Are you going to have enough money for a plane ticket? And are the planes going between Perth and Auckland or Brisbane and Auckland and Melbourne and Auckland? You know, all the borders are now closed and they are going to be in a situation where if their friends don't look after them or their family don't look after them here, um, they a whole lot of uncertainty. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I am interested to know, um, because I've been keeping in regular contact with my whānau that live in Australia, and some of them have been really upset by the delay, um, or the, the delay in which the Australian government has moved, especially when you compare things that are being done here, back at home in New Zealand, uh, and things that haven't been done in Australia. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Do I think that things should have moved faster? 100%. You will see online and in forums that you have not only Kiwis but Australians asking to be put in lockdown to try and control what is happening here in Australia. You know, they have got well over, what, two, 3,000 cases, you know, so far with COVID-19 and it's going to continue to spread if we don't get ser more serious measures put in place in each state government on top of the federal government are placing their own restrictions, which again, is quite hard to follow. And the anger is there, but also the anger is there not only for the pace that they're going, but 
at the pace at all of these announcements. People were losing jobs weeks ago um, at the very beginning of this, and, and it's now gotten to the point where you have got people that have literally said, you've handed me a death sentence, what do I do? Mm. Well, and look, it isn't enough. Our hearts go out to you all. We are thinking of you, uh, who uh, all our whānau that are in Australia, so... Uh, please do take care. We thank you for joining us uh, this morning. And, of course, Levi, uh, we'll be in touch again with you, of course, and, and we'll continue to follow your journey as you make your way home back to Whakatane. Nō reira, e mihi ana mātou ki a koutou. Thank you again for joining us and uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Kāti, ki tētahi atu take inaianei, iwi across the country have mobilised to stop the spread of COVID-19 in their rohe and protect their most vulnerable. From setting up phone lines to receive pātai from concerned whānau to establishing roadblocks to stop non-residents from entering their rohe. Shortly we'll take a closer look at some of these initiatives, but first here's Dean Nathan with a report on the support that's being given to whānau in Te Tai Tukero. Boxes of sausages to go to Whangaro over here. Kite toha toha i ngā kai hei whāngai i te katoa, a hatia kowai. Ko tēnei ko te tahi o ngā wahi hei, hei maunga mai i ngā trāka i ngā kai, kei te mahi tahi te kahu o taonui, ko ngā, ko ngā rangatira o ngā iwi katoa o te nōta nei e mahi tahi ana, kia ko tahi te kaupapa, nā... Haere mai we nei āhua tanga ki kō, ki kō, nā, ko te mea kei me mahi tahi mātou, ngā mea kei runga atu i a mātou, ngā mea kei, kei te hiku. Haere mai wā rātou tāngata ki te tiki mai ngā, i ngā mea kei kone, hei mau mā rātou ki, ki, ki te whāngai ki wā rātou anō iwi. Ko Arama Prime te kai whakarite rite me te kai toha toha ki te pū o te whekei. Uh, the fresh produce, so the apples, onions, potatoes, uh, cabbages, oranges uh, and sausages and then there's a lot of the uh, non-perishable like the water, the pasta, the canned fruit, the canned vegetables oh, and our bread as well. And we've got a lot more uh, kai arriving tomorrow as well, um, so this is just a part of it. Tēnei mahi mahi tēnei nui mō ngā hapu ngā iwi katoa, te iwi o ngā puhi. Um, Ki te awhi ngā kaumātua kuia, te mea tōtahi, me ngā whānau, ki te awhi, te aroha. Kore o mātou a whānau e, e, e mate ai, o e ware o e taimaha. Ko tōna tika ngā kua whaikai mārika ngā whānau mo te wiki tuatahi o te noho here ki te kāinga. Engari ko te whakaaro, kia taiki roto i ngā wiki tuarua, wiki tuatoru o tēnei āhua tanga, ka pauhare ngā kāpata kai, ka timata ai te rongo i te ngau o te kore kai. We're going to be rolling out our first um, deliveries on Monday um, and then from there there'll be regular intervals. Um, we're still finalising details whether that's going to be weekly, weekly or fortnightly, whichever is going to have the lowest amount of risk for us is, uh, is probably the route we'll take. Ia hatia e kōrero mia mai ana e te kāwana tanga mo te whā wiki, ta mātou mahi ki a tuatū, ki a māra mai ta mātou tiaki wa mātou tomātou iwi, mai i tāmaki ki te rerenga wairua. Dean Nathan, te ao Māori. Well, joining us now are two, hopefully three shortly, iwi leaders who are at the coalface working to support and protect Fano. We're still trying to reach Mere Mangu, the chair of Te Runanga Aiwi o Ngāpuhi, but joining us right now is Rawiri Waititi from Te Whano Apanui and chief executive of Ngāti Whātua Ōrāke Whai Maia, Rangi Mārie Hunia. Te nā kōrua. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora, Shane. Kia ora. Let's start with you both by... Talking about your whānau and uh, how are they coping based on what you understand, your intel, you're at the coalface working with your whānau right now, how are they coping right now? Sorry, maybe if we start with you, Rawiri, and then we'll come to Rangi Māori. Oh. OK, kapai. Um, so this is, COVID-19 is actually guiding the speed in which we react to this uh, particular kaupapa. Um, and um, so we, we're having... As, as you go along, you're trying to do your best to ensure that a COVID-19 has no opportunity to catch a ride with somebody into the iwi 
and find a host. Um, so our, our our messages right from the start um, have been to ensure that we we stop non-residents, um, tourists, uh, campers, and all those and, and outside fishermen to stop them from coming into the iwi, um, and to ensure that we keep the 200 vulnerable pakeke that we have in this iwi uh, safe. Um, so therefore, we've we've had to put some processes in place, uh, albeit hard for some of our people because the world has changed in the last two weeks. Um, it, it's it's a we're having to change our behaviour. Uh, we're having to change the way we look at um, uh, the different ways we do things in terms of shopping and things like that. So we've had to put some some pretty strong processes in place. And it's taken our iwi uh, a little bit um, of time to get used to, but we will get there uh, with some hard work um, and some collaborative thinking and strategies put in place by the iwi. And we finally see your face there, uh, Rawiri Te Nākwe. And I say yeah. that because uh, for the duration of that kōrero, unfortunately our viewers had to look at me. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, moving on, Rangi Marie, how are your whānau coping? How, how is Ngāti Whātua coping? Yeah, mihia nā ki ākwe, Shane. Uh, look, I think um, our people are phenomenally resilient. Um, Ngāti Whātua Rākei has, has got the majority of its population from Waikato through to the north. So we've got about 85% of our population, uh, you know, pretty close to us, and the majority of our whānau live in Tāmaki. So the way that we're responding, particularly to our Ngāti Whātua whānau, is really uh, taking quite a regional approach. We quite a lot of time the last week, engaging with all of our customers. So that has been our, uh, we have run more, we have uh, started sending out a whole lot of support mechanisms, kai and bits and pieces. Uh, and we've also started asking questions around risk factors and health needs, because it's not just COVID-19 asking us to respond in a really different way, it's changing really quickly. Uh, and we prepared to be able to do it as well as plan for. So it's a bit of what I think thinking about. I'm sorry, Rangi Māori, I'm going to have to jump yeah. in there because we're having issues hearing you and with your audio. But uh, while the team out back uh, fix that, um, I'll come back to you, Rawiri. So you've been out there blocking the roads, blocking access to your region. How's that been going? Um, yes, no, we've had, um, it's been pretty positive. Um, outcome in terms of that. It's been a localised approach the way we're doing things here at Whānau Apanui. We're working alongside our regional council, um, council sorry, and also with our local police um, to ensure that what we're doing is, has been done uh, in a safe uh, way to, to ensure that we, we're fulfilling the obligation that we're, um, that we're out to protect our people. Um, so we've, we've also got a, a big shopping uh, process in place now where people are doing job loss borderline um, to to ensure that we're not allowing this disease to have an opportunity to jump on somebody and come to the iwi. So, um, yeah, so this has been a huge um, lot of thinking and a lot of planning around how we do this uh, more effectively. Um, and we're still uh, feeling our way through this particular process, but our number one not, um, objective is to ensure that we cut down the risk and um, ensure that this ngangara doesn't find a way into the union. Rangi Maria, I understand that we've uh, got you back in contact, so let's give that another shot. Um, we, we couldn't really hear what you were saying before, so if you could um, tell us again about what you're doing to help support Farno, that would be great. Oh, he's just he's reached out to look fun. the first thing. And we started with uh, only not only he and in Aotearoa, overseas. So we've reached out to this particular in Australia. I'm sorry, Rangi Maria. E mihi atu ana kia koe, but, but, but we still can't um, get a solid signal from you. Unfortunately, right, Fano, this is what we have to contend with when we're using uh, online social media to be able to connect with one another. Um, but we'll still see what we can do out back to try and uh, restore that audio signal uh, with Rangi Maria. So we're back with you, Rawiri. Um, Rawiri, so... I'm interested to know and understand, how many people did you have to turn away? Did you have to ask to turn around as a result of them uh, coming to your blockades? Well, first of all, is the amount of um, tourists that come through State Highway 35, also those who have holiday batches here, um, also those who come through for the National Marlin Tournament, 
Um, but not only that, our own people that live away from home. So this is a hard time for us all. And what we've done is speak to our people who live outside of the iwi uh, to stay put, to stay where they are, uh, and, then, and ensure that um, that we, we give a, um, the best shot we can in terms of stopping COVID-19 mm-hmm. entering into the iwi. Because what we want effectively is that when they return home, is that they can return uh, home and to their people, to their old people, to their puppy, uh, who is our main demographic. Um, or it was a high demographic here in the iwi. So um, this is this is to ensure that our people living out home and just to give them some comfort that we're trying our best uh, to look after the whānau that are still living here in the iwi. And then we're trying our best to ensure that we protect our pakeke, their pakeke. So when they return home after all this is finished, our pakeke are still here with them. So a lot of iwi are saying um, to their whānau, look, whānau, if you live in urban centres, if you live outside the rohe, don't come home. Are you sharing the same sort of message with your people? Yes, we are. Um, and and, and the, the main reasons is, is that they're close, they're close to good health care. Um, we are not. Um, and then to have an influx of people coming, migrating home, would put huge pressure on the health system, the, the health system that we have here to find out. We're already Māori are, are marginalised when it comes to health care. Our geographical isolation also uh, proves that very difficult. Uh, for the people here living in, in, in the rural areas. So what we're saying is that people who live in town, to stay in town, you're closer to health care if, if you're affected by COVID-19. Um, but to have con- some consideration for those who live at home, and especially our pakeke, who have 200 vulnerable pakeke plus those who have existing health conditions, um, is that we need our health, our very small and limited health system to be dealing with the people at home. I do, uh, before we wrap, want to ask your view and opinion of the guidelines that the government has released regarding tangihanga. What advice are you giving your marae, your people, when it comes to uh, dealing with tūpāpaku, managing tūpāpaku, managing the tangihanga process? We have had to have some courageous and brave conversations here in the iwi around that particular process because being an iwi that is entrenched in its traditions, um, those, those conversations have been quite difficult for some. Um, but they've had to be courageous with the families. We've already had a tangihanga here at Whānaupi, not due to COVID-19, but because one of our pakeke had passed away. And that family showed some real um, um, sense and, um, and leadership in that particular space. So they notified the whole iwi to say that, hey, um, to keep everybody safe, this is the way we're doing things. And I think whānau, um, we trust our whānau to be able to make those, those calls. Um, and we've left it with whānaus. All the marais are closed. They, they are uh, consulting with their ministers and their tohunga of their hahi um, to ensure that they can work through a process. The ministers here in Whānaupuni, the Anglican ministers and the, the Ringatū tohunga, um, they've also had conversations around how they will deal with mate here in the iwi. Um, so at this particular time, there are no three-day tangihanga, there are no hākari, um, and we're trying to, to do this as respectfully as we can. In 1918, when the Spanish flu hit Whānaupuni, um, there were just mass hole, mass. There was a one hole, a mass grave uh, for those people who were affected by the Spanish flu back in 1918. We've got tombs here that remind us of that. We've got cemeteries here that were set up for just for just children that remind us of that. Hence, why we're taking the drastic measures and changes here in Whanaupuni to ensure that COVID-19 finds no way into this. Kapa i tēnā koe uh, rāwari i e nā whakamārama i e nā kōrero. Me tō whakawāte i a koe anō kia mātou whakaata Māori e mihi ana mātou. Kia koe o tira kia koutou. Kia ora, tēnā tātou. Kia kaha kia tātou i tiwi Māori. Kia ora. Kāti e hikama. Well, that's our programme for today. Apologies to Rangi Māori e Hunia and of course Mere Mangu who we weren't able to uh, track down uh, for today's show. But who knows, we'll hopefully have them back here uh, someday soon. Well, those are, uh, that's our kōrero and that's our show for today. Join us tomorrow when we look at what DHBs or your local district health boards are doing to support Māori communities. Koe nā a tapatahi mo tēnei rā, kia piki te ora, te kaha me te maramatanga kia koutou katoa, hei ko nā mo tēnei wā. Mm-hmm.